Wouldn't it be strange if you just like always left your door open? I mean, if your door was always wide open, not just when people were invited, but like any time of the day, and anybody and everyone could just walk in whenever they wanted. And you just stand there and you let them in. They walk into your house, they ravage your cabinets, they empty your fridge, they sit on your sofas, they sleep on your beds, they, they completely destroy your house. Imagine not that they're adults who kind of have some control, but they're kids, right? High on sugar, maybe it's Halloween, and you open the door and these kids just run in and they just make a mess of your house. Um, they're on sugar high already and they're ripping up your house apart trying to find more candy. That would be weird if you allowed it to happen. The problem is we actually do this kind of thing all the time. We leave our doors open. We let things in. We let possessions in. We let all kinds of stuff into our lives that necessarily aren't supposed to be welcome there. The Bible, even our text this morning, refers to our heart as our home. That's what he's talking about when he, in our passage, he talks about the house. He's talking about our heart. The term house, home, is referred to about 10 times just in chapter 3 alone. An interesting observation about this home, this heart of ours, it never remains vacant. It's never empty. It's always full. It's full of guests, and the problem is we keep inviting more in. Why do we do that? Why do we keep letting people or possessions into our lives? We invite people, things, into our lives because, as St. Augustine said, is our hearts are restless until we find our rest in God. Or put it another way, our hearts are always filled until we make God our home. Our hearts are occupied with other things until it's occupied by God. Because we're programmed, because we're created to have God as to take residence in our heart, that's how we're made. We're made in his image. Our hearts are to be welcome for him. He's supposed to occupy it. But often that isn't the case. Instead of having our hearts as homes for God, they're homes for all kinds of other guests. These guests enslave us. They take advantage of us. They abandon us. And they destroy us. They abuse us. These guests trash the place. They look nice when we first come in. They seem appealing as they walk in. They promise all kinds of things like safety, security. They promise that you'll never be alone. They promise you'll never be broke. They promise you'll never struggle. But they, you let them into your house. You feel like you need them. They come in and they trash the place. They become like trespassers that will never leave. They take residence there and they destroy your house. These guests actually have names in the Bible. The Bible calls these guests that come into our hearts as idols. And the funny thing about these idols is they're not statues that people worship, but they're things that we crave and desire more than God. And all of us have idols. Whether you're wearing a suit or a flannel, whether you have chains and piercings or you're clean cut and preppy, whether you're a thug or a drug addict or you're a churchgoer or a do-gooder, we have all different kinds of outfits on, and we look different. You can be religious or irreligious, but we all have idols in our lives, and they are damaging, and they are deadly. Religious people have religious guests or idols in their lives, things like morality or service or good works. Irreligious people have idols in their lives, possessions or money or fame. And all of these come in, and they work as saviors. What I mean by that is, they try to come into your life as ways of you avoiding Jesus as a true joy and satisfaction for your life. Religious people want to avoid Jesus as Savior because they want to bring other things into their life, like good works, like going to church, like giving away money. If I do these things, if I do all of these good things, then I will have find joy, I will find satisfaction, I will be accepted. All of these things that the gospel promises, but they try to find in what they do. Irreligious people do the exact same thing. They might not do it for the right same heart motivation, but they don't, and they don't do the same thing that religious people do, but they go after other things in the world. If I can possess this, if I can have this girl, if I can be married to this guy, if I can have this, then I will find joy and satisfaction and fulfillment, and I will find in this person everything I'm lacking. They're both ways of avoiding Jesus. In the end, a religious person is just as enslaved or lost as an irreligious person because both are avoiding Jesus. While the irreligious person may completely ignore Jesus, 
A religious person just wants Jesus to help him or be an example to him. Neither of them want Jesus as a savior. And what we'll see today in our text is Jesus calling both of these groups out. He's calling the religious people out. He's calling the irreligious people out. And he's telling them that you can't avoid Jesus. You are confronted with him, and he needs to be addressed in your life. The church in Hebrews are at a point where they're being tempted to quit. They're being tempted to give up because they're facing all sorts of persecution for their faith. They're going through trials and disappointments and discouragement because they believe in Jesus. They're tempted to go back to religion, to the law, to Moses, to Judaism, because it's safe. There's something safe about doing religious duty. The writer is saying that life is in Jesus, but you're abandoning it to go back to laws and rituals and the, um, the things of Judaism. These guys have two options. You can go to the home of Jesus and grace and the gospel, or you can go back to the home of Moses or Judaism and the law. Do you realize that even as Christians, our nature is to run back to religion? It's not to be in relationship with Jesus, but it's on what we do in our faith. Martin Luther so that religion is the deep default of our heart. We always want to go back to finding our significance and comfort and value in the things we do. And the things we do, we find hope in them. We want to go back to religion because religion gives us a matrix of whether we're, we're meeting our religious obligations or requirements. Think about it. How many of you have said, God, look at all these things I do for you. You should answer my prayer. I go to church, I pray, I read the Bible, I do all of these things. You're obligated to meet my needs. Some of you this morning are doing religious duty and you think that religious duty saves you. And Jesus says, you're in bondage, you're enslaved, you're never enjoying me. The image in our text is the idea that there's this home and Jesus is knocking to get in very same image that we see in Revelation where Jesus comes to the church and he says, behold, I'm standing at the the door of your heart and I'm knocking. If you let me in, I'll come in and I'll dine with you. Do you realize that in Revelation, Jesus isn't talking to unbelievers? He's not saying to an unbeliever, hey, if you let me in, I'll come in and dine with you. He's actually talking to believers. He's actually talking to the church. Think about it. These guys are on the inside. They're reading the Bible. They're going to church. They're praying. They're worshiping. They're doing communion. They're doing all of the things they're supposed to be doing. And Jesus is on the outside saying, hey, who you're singing about, who you're reading about, who you're worshiping, that's me. Would you let me in? Would you let me come in? If you let me in, I will fellowship with you. I'll come and I'll eat at your table. You don't just have to go through the motions of your faith, but I will hang out with you. I will be intimate with you. I will sit at your table and, de- and, and eat with you. You see how easy it is for a church to actually avoid Jesus by doing things for Jesus? We can be busy in doing things, but we miss Jesus. I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. If you hear my voice, if you let me in, I will come in. I will eat with you. What an inviting message. Some of you today have never welcomed Jesus into your heart. He hasn't taken residence there. Others of you, you believe he's there, and he is. But he's been kept out of your heart. He's been kept out of your life. There are places in your life that you haven't welcomed Jesus into. And this morning, God's calling us to address and deal with those things in our life. So he does a comparison. He compares what life with Jesus is like versus life in religion. In religion, um, you find abandonment. You find you're enslaved. You find you are disappointed. But in Jesus, you you find family. You find faithfulness. You find freedom. And that's what the writer talks about. Here's what you find. You find freedom, you find faithfulness, you find family. Look at verse 1, verse 1 of Hebrews 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle, the high priest of our confession. The writer wants them, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus. Consider Jesus. He writes his entire letter so far, and he reminds them who Jesus is. He reminds them what Jesus has done, and he wants them to consider the freedom that's in Jesus. Don't go back to bondage. Don't go back to being enslaved to the things you're enslaved in, but consider Jesus. In Jesus, there is freedom. 
The writer uses the imagery in chapter 1 of us being in a boat and slowly drifting away from Jesus, drifting away from this great salvation. And the image here is that we're drifting away back into religious duty, back into religious rituals, back into religious obligations. And we're going back, not into freedom, but into bondage. And the writer wants to save us from that. Remember, these guys are from a Jewish background. This is what they grew up in. All they knew was religion. All they knew was laws and sacrifices and being at the temple and going to the synagogue. This is the only thing that they knew. Many of us have grew up in this kind of environment where church was the center of our lives. Everything that we did was based on the church. It was going to Sunday services, going to Tuesday services, going to Saturday night services, fasting prayers, religious meetings. Everything was revolved around the church. We grew up in environments where church was everything. This is all they understood, and this is how they related to God. And then comes Jesus. He blows all of it apart. He was God who becomes man. He suffers, dies to deliver us from the fear of death and lifelong slavery. And in fact, he calls religion slavery. He says, you're bound by what you do. These guys were tempted to go back because it was safer in religion. It's safe. It's safe because if I, I know if I do this and I do this and I don't do this and I say these prayers, then I'm okay. But a relationship with Jesus, that's risky. That's dangerous. I don't know what he's going to call me to do. Sometimes he might actually tell me to do things that are contrary to what religion says. He'll tell me to love people who don't love God. He'll tell me to go fellowship with people who have abandoned God. He, it's risky following Jesus because you don't know what he's going to call you to do. These guys fear death because a religious person never knows if they've done enough to please God. What a horrible place to be. They could actually be in a place where you're around the things of God, but you never know if you've done enough to be accepted by God. That's where religion comes in. I remember growing up, I'm a pastor's kid, so we always had guest pastors at our house. And I remember one day there's this guest pastor that came, and uh, me and my brother just happened to get into a fight that day. We'd never do stuff like that. Um, but we got into a fight that night, and this pastor made this comment that if Jesus came back that night and we were still angry with one another, I wouldn't go to heaven because there was unconfessed sin in my life. What a horrible way to live. Always fearful. Always wondering if you did enough, if you prayed enough, if you did the right things so that you can make it to heaven, not because you love Jesus. And an insecure person emotionally is either always fearful or is always proud, right? And you've seen that. This is the way it always shows up. A religious person reacts to life either fearful or they're proud. You've seen religious people who can be very insecure in their life. You've seen ones that are very proud and self-righteous. Pride because they live up to their own standards. Fear because they don't live up to the standards they've created. And the reality is they fluctuate from being fearful to proud their entire lives. They're always unstable because they're never sure. They feel prideful when they do their religious duties and fearful when they don't. Because deep down they know that if God held them to their own standards, they'd never make it. If they, God held them to their own standards of what they hold other people to, they'll never make it. Much less God's standards. Think about it. You know it's true. If you took your phone and held it on record for an entire week and just recorded your conversations, all the things you grumbled about, about other people, all the things you griped about, about other people, all those standards that you expect from other people in your life, if God held you to those very standards, well, unlikely none of us would make it. And you would never meet God's standards. That's why a religious person is insecure. And here comes Jesus to break the bondage, break the fear. How does he do that? He does it in two ways. Our text says that he comes so that we can hear from God and that we can have a way to God. Our verse says that he is our apostle and he is our high priest. That's what it means. He's our apostle, he's our high priest. Apostle. We hear from God. He speaks for God. High priest. He suffers and dies and gives us a way to God. That's what it means to be an apostle and a high priest of our confession. He came to break religion. This is the only place in the Bible where Jesus is called an apostle. If you didn't know our verse today and I asked you who an apostle was, you would mention the disciples, you'll mention Peter, you'll mention Paul, you'll mention those guys, but you never would think of Jesus as an apostle. But an apostle basically is a sent one. Was Jesus sent? 
He was. He was the delegate from the Trinity. He was the one that came down. God comes into human flesh, represents himself. He was the sent one. He was God's delegate. He was dispatched to communicate to us the gospel, the good news. What is that? Really simple. The good news, the gospel, is the opposite of religion. In Jesus, we hear from God, which is our greatest need, and it's actually good news. However, religion is bad news. Religion says, if I obey God, I will be accepted. I obey God, therefore I am accepted and loved. The gospel says, I am accepted, I am loved, now I can obey God freely. Two totally different ways of looking at life. The motivation in religion is based on our fear and insecurity. However, the motivation in the gospel is grateful joy. God loves me. I get to serve him. In religion, when I am criticized, I am furious and I am devastated because it's critical that I think of myself as a good person so that God can accept me. In the gospel, if I'm criticized, I struggle with it, but I'm, it's not essential for me to think of myself as a good person because my identity isn't found in what other people think. My identity is found in Jesus. In religion, my prayer life, largely consists of petitions, and it gets heated when things are going wrong in my life. That's why religious people often don't pray. They don't pray often, but when things get hard, they pray hard. When things get tough, they start praying all the time, and their only concern is the situation that they're currently in. For a religious person, a prayer is only something that they use when they need it. But in the gospel, your prayer life is completely different. Because your prayer life isn't primarily concerned about your needs, but it begins with praise and adoration for what God did. The main person for the prayer of the individual that understands the gospel, the main reason the person prays is fellowship and relationship with God. In religion, my identity, my self-worth is based on how hard I work, how moral I am, how good I am. So I have to look down on others who don't meet the standards, and I've got to look down on those who are lazy or immoral. But in the gospel, my identity and my self-worth isn't centered on what I do, but it's centered on the one who died for me. I am saved by grace, so I don't have to look down on other people. I am who I am by God's grace. I didn't earn this. I'm not smarter than anyone else. I'm not better than anyone else. That's why I'm a Christian, because I was smarter than you. I am a Christian because God in his grace and mercy saved me and redeemed me. And because of that, I don't have to look down on other people, but I can show them grace and love because it wasn't because of my smartness that I'm saved. It was because of God's goodness and God's mercy. Do you see the difference between a religious person and one who's centered on Jesus? Religion and the gospel are two completely different worldviews. They look different in the people that it produces. The gospel is good news. Religion is bad news. By the way, it's good news. Religion is good advice. It tells you what to do. It's counsel. It gives you something to do that you haven't done yet. Do this and you'll be okay. Say this and you'll be fine. Pray like this and you'll be accepted. But the gospel is not good advice. It's good news. News is something that's already happened. That's what good news is. It's the announcement of something good has already happened in your life. And now we're proclaiming it. Jesus has already saved you. Jesus has already redeemed you. He's already died for you. While you were still a sinner, he came to rescue you. Here's the good news. Religion is just telling you what you need to do so you can be accepted. See, this is what Jesus as our apostle communicates to us. There are things that he says to us. He tells us, come to me, you who are weak and heavy laden and burdened. I will give you rest. Do you know who he's talking to when he says that? He's speaking to religious people. Why? Because religious person, you can never rest. You never know when you've done enough. You never know if you've earned God's love. And he says, take my yoke. Learn from me. I am gentle. I'm lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. As an apostle, he tells us, who the sun sets free will be free indeed. But a religious person is never free. They're bound by all kinds of things that they do or keep and keep doing. They're never free. Can you hear Jesus as an apostle speaking to us this morning, telling us to stop trying to get God to love you? You're enslaving yourself by trying to do good things to get God's acceptance. I've come down to bring God to you because I'm God. 
How did he bring us to God? That's the high priest part. The apostle communicates the good news to us. The high priest provides the way to God. In chapter 2, the writer reminds us that we have a faithful and a merciful high priest who makes propitiation on our behalf. Propitiation. What does that mean? Basically, it means to satisfy. The Bible uses big words, but they have very simple meanings. Propitiation means to satisfy. Satisfy the judgment and the wrath of God for you. You deserve hell. You deserve judgment. You deserve death. You deserve punishment. But Jesus says, I will satisfy what you deserve. I will make sure it's taken care of. I will take your place. The punishment that you deserve, it's not going to be ignored. Someone will bear the brunt of what you deserve. And Jesus says, I'll take it for you. Do you see the freedom in this? When Jesus, the gospel and grace, is at home in your heart, you're free from the chains of oughts and shoulds and what you need to do that religious people cling on to. You're free from all of that. You don't have to appease God by your morality or your good works. Jesus does it for you. Now you want to please God and live for him. There is freedom. There's power. There's motivation. There's grace. Now when you read the Bible, you see that the Bible is all about Jesus and what he did for you not about what you need to do for God. So many of us read the Bible completely wrong. We turn it upside down. We read it as a book that tells us what we need to do for God when actually it's a story from Genesis to Revelation about what Jesus does for us. So how do we respond? The writer says, consider Jesus. Consider him. Have you considered him this morning? Have you considered Jesus? The word basically means to reflect, to think about, to fix your attention, to stop what you're doing and pay attention, to look at the details, to see what's going on. Pay attention, learn from it, consider Jesus, take some time, meditate on him. How often do you stop and just think about Jesus? So many Christians forget the gospel and wander back off into religion because they don't consider Jesus. They may have passing thoughts about him. They may glance at him. They may look at him to help them. They may do things for him, but they don't stop to consider him. Have you considered Jesus lately? When's the last time you did that? When's the last time you pulled back and just said, Jesus, you are awesome. I can't imagine that you would die for me. When have you been captured by what Jesus has done for you? See, when we stop to give attention to Jesus, we drift off back into religion. We start living out this moral performance and narrative of life instead of a grace narrative. How do you know if you're living a life of grace or a life of religion? It shows up in how you feel. Fear, pride, worry, anxiety, cowardice are all emotional responses of religion. When you start thinking about your life and your job depends on how you perform, when really your life, and your, your life and your joy depends on how you perform, when really your life and your joy should be based on what Jesus has already done for you. That's when we become consumed by how we're performing and what we're doing. We're concerned about how we look before others. We're concerned about what other people will think about us. Guys, Jesus didn't die a horrible death on the cross so we can sit here and play church and do religious duties. That's not what he died for. He didn't die for us to be religious people. He came so we would stop and consider Jesus. Because when you consider him, and when you think about him, and when you meditate on him, all of, a li- all of a sudden your life becomes transformed and you begin to do things for him. Stop. Consider Jesus. Why do you do the things that you do? Is it because you're trying to earn something from God? Or is it because you have been captured by the love of Jesus in your life? Stop, consider Jesus. So he offers them freedom. Religion enslaves them. Religion keeps them in bondage. Religion never gives them freedom to enjoy God. And Jesus says, I've come to give you freedom. The second thing that he offers in our text is a home of faithfulness. Look at verse 2. Who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Here, um, he introduces good old Moses into his story. We need to stop and think about him so you can understand what the writer is saying. Moses was a man. He was the man. But things didn't start off well for him. But he was a pretty faithful man. He followed through on what God had said. God calls him a faithful person in the book of Numbers. You've seen the 
beer commercials of the most interesting man in the world. Um, Moses is the most interesting man in the world. He probably even looked like the guy in the commercials with the beard and everything. He was divinely chosen for an epic task. He became the incomparable deliverer of his people through an unparalleled display of God's power. He was Israel's greatest prophet. He was the lawgiver, the conduit for the Ten Commandments, the Levitical law, the sacrificial system, the tabernacle. He was also his, Israel's greatest historian. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, the whole history of their nation. He was said to be more humble than any other man ever on the face of the earth. And that's pretty awesome considering everything he did. Here's the kicker. When he dies, humans don't bury him. God himself comes and takes him and hides him. And no one knows where he's buried. He is the most interesting man. Welcoming Moses and his law into the hearts of the people in hopes of finding acceptance and love and faithfulness meant something to these guys. That's all they knew. This is the only thing that their family was familiar with. This was the background of their faith. This is what they turned from, and now they're being tempted to go back to it because they found acceptance in following the rules of Moses. In Moses, there was security. If I'm doing this, if I'm obeying the Ten Commandments, I must be okay. I must be accepted. God must love me. I did this. Now God must owe me. You ever feel like that? But did Moses and the type of law that he represented give acceptance and love and faithfulness? Did he bring that? In fact, he didn't. Romans, Paul says, I was once alive when I didn't know the law. But when the law encountered me, sin came and I became dead. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. What's he saying? He's saying that before he understood the law, he thought he was okay. He was fine. He thought he was a nice guy. He thought he looked good. But all of a sudden, this mirror came in front of him, and he realized how horrible he was. The mirror was the law that met the standards of God. And he looked at the standards of God and said, I'm a mess. I'm a nightmare. The law which promised life actually proved death to me because it showed me that I'm a failure. The law actually revealed how broken I am, that it would bring life if we met the requirements, but I couldn't do it. I'm never able to meet the law. It was supposed to give life, but it produced death. The writer says that the law, you got to catch this image, is part of the puzzle. It's just one piece of the puzzle. He doesn't throw Moses and the law under the bus and say, ignore the law. He says the law was essential. It was a piece of the puzzle. It needed to be there to complete the picture of Jesus. The law was supposed, supposed to point us back to Jesus. The writer is saying that Jesus is faithful where Moses and our attempts to fulfill the law has failed. Look at verse 3. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. He's saying as cool as Moses was and as much as he did, he was only part of what Jesus made. He's only part of the creation. He's only part of the puzzle. He's a necessary piece of the puzzle. All of the things that Moses represents for them, Jesus fulfills for them. The law, the Levitical system, the ceremonies, the priesthood, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, all of these are puzzle pieces, and they all point to Jesus. Jesus says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. That's pretty impressive. If you read the first five books of the Bible, you're not going to find the name of Jesus mentioned there at all, but he's there. He is the fulfillment of all things that Moses writes about. It all points back to Jesus. So many people miss the forest of the gospel for the tree of religion. They read the Bible like any other religious book. Some of you think that. This is just another religious book that I need to read to improve my life. It's a book of rules with stories that illustrate how to keep the rules. But what if the entire Bible was a story? What if it was a complete, true story all the way through so that each little story pointed back to the greater story of the gospel and each rule that was there pointed back to the hero called Jesus? What if, it was the way, what if that's the way we're supposed to read the Bible? Not as rules and regulations for us to keep, but to realize that everything in there is to point back to the gospel, to point back to Jesus. See, every world religion out there is opposite of Christianity. 
Whatever religion you subscribe to, you aren't earning points with God. Every good work that you do, every good intention that you have, every dollar you give away is another brick you're laying on the pathway to hell because you're trying to avoid Jesus through those good things. You're avoiding Jesus. You're doing the same thing that someone else does that says they hate Jesus. You're doing the same thing. But Moses was a pretty faithful guy, wasn't he? He was a pretty good guy. He was. But was Moses faithful to the end? Did he walk with the people of Israel into the promised land? He didn't. But Jesus did. Is Moses still walking with them today? He isn't. Is Moses still faithful to keep them and walk with them through their trials? He isn't. Jesus was the only one faithful because death couldn't stop his faithfulness. Um, Can someone turn that off? Do you understand that? Moses' faithfulness is done. Whatever faithfulness he had is over when he died. He isn't doing anything from heaven now. Only Jesus can be faithful through death. Jesus faithfully goes through temptation, suffered terribly without ever giving in. He faithfully goes to Gethsemane. He faithfully yielded his hands to the nails. He faithfully became sin for us, even after wave after wave of the world's sin was poured on him over his sinless soul. And again and again in those hours on the cross, his soul recoils and convulses as all the lies of civilization, the murders of thousands of innocent people, the obnoxious brew of hatred and jealousy and pride were all thrown upon the purity of Jesus. He becomes a curse for us. And in the darkness, Jesus bears all of it in silence. And he faithfully dies. And as a resurrected high priest, he faithfully intercedes. He is always faithful. He's always faithful. He was faithful in his life. He was faithful in his death. He was faithful in his resurrection. And right now when you need him, he is faithfully interceding for you. He is faithful. That means practically speaking, Jesus is the one when he takes residence on your heart, he will never walk out on you. Like every other person or object that you put into your heart and welcome into your life, they will leave you. They will abandon you. Every other religion will forsake you. Every other person will let you down. Every possession that you cling to will eventually fail. Every position that you obtain will eventually disappear. Your wealth will disappoint you. Your friends will let you down. Your spouse will disappoint you at times. There will be times that you yourself will let yourself down. No one is going to walk with you when you die. Your family will not walk with you to the grave. They won't go six feet under with you. But Jesus says, I will never leave you. I'll never abandon you. And when you face death I will be where with you when you go through the grave I will be with you and when you come to the other side I will be there welcoming you I will be faithful to you every step of the way I will never forsake you he will walk with you all the way through the other side no one else can promise you that that's why in the book of Hebrews the writer is constantly reminding them about the faithfulness of Jesus because we need to hear that At the end of the letter, Jesus reminds them that he will never leave us or forsake us. I think I told you this before, but the actual translation of that verse is not, I will ever leave you or forsake you. The actual translation is horrible English, but it's powerful theology. In the actual Greek, the writer says, he puts five double negatives in that verse. And the verse, if you translate it literally, says, I will never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. You can't have a more powerful statement. Everyone else, everything else will fail you. Everyone else will leave you. Your wife will not go to the grave with you. But Jesus says, not so with me. Never, 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 never. Listen, the things that you hold dear to your life, the things that you find your identity in, whether that's your job or your career or your wealth or maybe it's your family, the things that you find your identity in that says this is who I am, all of that will disappoint you. All of that will fail you. Family fails you. Your wealth will fail you. Your career will disappoint you. Jesus says when all of that fails, 
when all of that is gone, you can look back and say the one thing that has been consistent day in, day out, in the good times, in the bad times, in those moments of discouragement and in those moments when everything was going well, the one thing that has been consistent was that I never left you. When I take residence in your heart, the one thing that I can guarantee you is that I will never leave. See, that's the fear of many relationships, isn't it? People leave. Things break. Possessions are gone. That's the fear. And even if people leave, if they return, they'll only leave again. But only Jesus stays. Listen, do you know why he will stay? Not simply because he promised He'll stay because he's already gone all the way to the bottom with you. He knows you better than you know yourself. So there's nothing that's going to be uncovered in your life that he doesn't already know about. He already knows about it. But that's the fear of many relationships. If people only knew about me, if they only found out my secret sins, if they only knew about the darkness of my heart, they would never talk to me again. Maybe that's true, right? Maybe they would never talk to you if they knew the real you. Maybe they would never want to be associated with you if they knew the real stuff in your life. But Jesus knows you all the way to the bottom. And he says, I'll take home in your life. There's nothing that's going to surprise him. He's not leaving you. He isn't leaving. He's there till the end. Going to the cross, he knew everything that you were going to do. He knew everything that you will do. He knew every intention of your heart. He knew all of that before you did it. And he says, I'll still die for you. I will still give my life for you. Nothing you do will shock him. Nothing you do will surprise him to say, I'm leaving. He says, I'll never leave you. He's a faithful God. The last thing, it's a, he makes your home a family. Verse 5, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. I love that. House, by the way, is never referred to as a building. This is you. This is me. We are his house. Here again, the writer isn't throwing Moses under the bus. He's saying that he needs to be put in his proper place. He was a servant to our hearts. He and the law prepares us for Jesus and points us toward Jesus. We need the law. Why? To point you to Jesus. We need to read about your need for a Savior and about your sin. You need to read about not coveting and then see that you covet and point you toward Jesus. You need to read about not lusting and sense your lusting in your heart and then turn to Jesus. You need the law of God to continue to point you toward Jesus. Because if you don't read the law and you don't see your need for Jesus, you're going to realize that do you realize what will happen? You think you'll be okay. You think you're fine. And you'll become self-righteous. You become prideful. You think you have it all together. In reality, you don't. That's why you need to read it all the way through, even the parts you don't like. Stuff that makes you uncomfortable basically says that Moses and the law is like this. Moses is like the front lawn of our home with a sign that says, listen, run to Jesus, you idiot. Run to Jesus. Go inside the house. He's there. Stop looking at me. I'm just a messenger. My life is about pointing you toward Jesus. Notice it says that Moses testified to things spoken later. To accept Moses is to accept Jesus. Moses knew that Jesus was coming. He himself said it in the book of Deuteronomy. He said, the Lord is going to raise you up a prophet from among you. It is to him that you shall listen. Moses' whole life was about pointing people back to the Savior. The writer says that we are his home. Do you realize how crazy that sounds if you stop and thought about it? The God of the universe 
who spoke everything into existence with one word, says, I'm going to come and live inside of you. I'm going to live in your heart. God's going to take his residence in this dark, decaying, broken heart. He's going to live there? That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to us, but you got to understand, it didn't make sense at all to the culture to which the writer was writing. This is the cultural part that you've got to understand. Imagine the early conversations for these guys. Small church, inner city Rome. No one believes what they believe about Jesus. Imagine a conversation, whether it was with a Jew or a Gentile. Here's where we go. Hey, you're a Christian, right? Um, yeah, I think I am. I'm a follower of Jesus. Let me ask you something because I don't understand your religion. I'm really interested. Okay, ask away. Where are your temples? Um, we don't have temples. Our heart is our temple. Where are your priests? Um, we don't have a priest. Jesus is our priest. What about your sacrifices to appease your God? Um, Jesus is our sacrifice, and he's actually our God. So basically, he died for himself. And you got to imagine, when people are listening to this, to this they're saying, What? What kind of religion is this? And the answer to that question is, we don't have a religion. We got a savior. We got a person. We got Jesus. We got a relationship. Do you see how radical this was for them in their time? Just as it is today, it didn't make any sense. Do you know what they called Christians in Rome? At that time, Roman historians called Christians atheists. That's what they were labeled as. They had no God that they believed in. They didn't have temples. They didn't have priests. They didn't have sacrifices. There was nothing there. That's why they were called atheists. Everyone else had all of these things except the Christians. Moses was a servant to the house. But Jesus was the son. What does that mean? Jesus was faithful over God's house as a son. He's a son. What does it mean that Jesus is a son in the home of our heart? It means we're family. That's exactly what he's saying in this text. He said it earlier in chapter 2. Remember the imagery of last week where I had the guy standing up here and Bino was holding his, the two around them and saying, me and my sons, we will trust Jesus, trust God. That's what Jesus comes in and says, me and my family, together, we're family. I died for them. They are my family. What this means practically is that every idle guest you invite to your home, every ultimate thing that you think must give you significance and value, whether it's a person or a place or a possession or a feeling of approval by others, whatever it may be, that is not family. It's not family because every one of those things, have, you have to prove your word to them. Family, when it's operating the way it's supposed to be, when it's operating the way God has designed it to be, you don't have to prove your word to them because you are approved because you're part of the family. They're family. They love you regardless of your performance. That's how a family is supposed to operate. That's what's going on here. Everything else we bring in is not family. We've got to prove our worth over and over again. If you fail, they'll leave you. Your boss will fire you. Your bank will take your possessions. Your wife will leave you. Your boyfriend will dump you because you just aren't good enough. This is what happens with every, idol, every other idol in your life. And here comes Jesus and he says, I will be at home in your heart. I am family and you don't have to prove your worth to me because I identify with you. I will be there with you regardless of how you perform. I've seen you all the way to the bottom. I've seen how bad you were before I went to the cross, and I still died for you. That's empowering. That's life-changing. That should create a life of worship in you. That's why he closes by saying that we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. He's not saying that we need to hold on to Jesus so that we can make it it's more like we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope because of what he's done. This is empowering. This makes the Christian want to hold on. He clings to Jesus, not because he ought to or should or is required to, but because he wants to. He's not going to leave this. When he understands the gospel, he's not going to walk away from this. When he realizes what Jesus has done for him, he's not going to abandon Jesus. 
Here's my call to you this morning. Here's my challenge to you this morning. Clearly, this church in Hebrews has drifted away and has been tempted to drift from Jesus to some other functional Savior in their lives. They needed to see that their hearts belonged to Jesus. He alone is supposed to take residence there. He alone is supposed to dwell there. And the truth of the gospel should dig dig deep into your soul. The writer of Hebrews knows this. He knows that these guys are hard-headed, just like we are. He knows that they resist kicking out these idols because they find value, significance in these idols. So he goes all the way back to the Old Testament and reminds them of the Exodus. In verses 7 to 11, he tells them about the Hebrew exile from Exodus, and he talks about how they rebelled. Jesus breaks into the reality of these people being in bondage and releases them from bondage, takes them to the promised land, they get near to it, and they're ready to turn back to their idols and their old ways of life. Moses sends some spies into the promised land. They go in, they check it out, and these spies are scared out of their minds. Why? Because there's some big big people there. So they basically tell the God, I don't think you can handle this one. They didn't think God could handle it. They get to the edge of the Jordan, and they look at the river, and they say, God, I don't think you can handle this. And God says, I just split the sea open, and you're telling me I can't open a river for you? But he opens the river. They walk to the promised land, and you know what they did? They complain. They whine. They want to go back. They want to go back to religion. They want to go back to their old way of life. They want to go back to their idols. And God says, fine, you can wander around here in the wilderness for 40 years, and all of you will die except two of you. So the writer brings the story out for a reason. He tells them, guys, don't be dumb. Don't be stupid. Don't refuse the invitation and be hard-headed. Kick the idols out. Put the red carpet out for Jesus. Don't choose bondage over freedom. Don't choose abandonment over faithfulness. Don't choose rejection over family because that's what's waiting for you back there in religion. That's what's there in following the law and traditions. But listen, Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart and he says, let me in. Let me walk in because I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to sit with you and eat with you and fellowship with you. And my life, my presence in your life will completely transform you. Don't go back to religion. So your response to that should be very simple. It should be, I'm ready, Jesus. Help me get rid of these unwanted guests. Help me believe that you're the Lord of my life. Help me to stop playing games and get real. The question is, are you ready for that this morning? Are you ready for Jesus to walk into your heart? Are you ready for Jesus to walk through your whole house, the entire house? Are you open to him removing unwanted guests and kicking them out? Are you ready for that to take place? Because that's painful. It's a little scary because you know if Jesus started walking through your heart, there are areas in your life that you've tried to hide that he will completely expose. There are things that you don't want anyone to know about. It's scary. The psalmist writes, God, would you search me? Would you know my heart? Would you try me? And see if there's any wickedness in me. And would you lead me into the way everlasting? Are you ready for that? Let me end, this, end with this. Maybe Jesus needs to spend time in the different rooms of your house. Maybe he needs to spend some time in the library of your heart, your mind. Maybe there are books on the shelves there or images on the wall that needs to go. Maybe it's past relationships that you can't get out of your mind. And Jesus' memories, ideas, past vices that have, need to be taken down, they shouldn't be welcome there anymore. Maybe Jesus needs to be welcome into the dining room of your heart, your desires, your appetites. Maybe it's money or degree or fame or fortune that's on the menu. And maybe Jesus needs to write a brand new menu for you. Maybe Jesus needs to go into the living room the place where you hang out. Maybe there are people that Jesus needs to pull you away from. Maybe there are activities or games and things in your life that you need to straighten out. Maybe Jesus needs to spend some time in the garage or the storage shed where all your toys are kept. They're using up your God-given talents and time and treasure to make much of you and your ambitions instead of much of Jesus and his glory and his fame. Maybe he needs to do some work there. Maybe he needs to peek into the closets of your home And not just find the things that you're deliberately trying to hide, but there are some things in your closet that you're trying to hide from. Maybe you find yourself in a closet and Jesus needs to pull you out from there in the light of his grace. 
Maybe there's a lot of shame in that closet and Jesus needs to work on. Some of you are, have been damaged by stuff in the past before you came to Jesus. And while you've been forgiven, you haven't let Jesus heal you. They're in the closet even today and it affects your relationships today. And Jesus says, would you let me in and would you let me clean you? Would you let me heal you? Let me touch you. Maybe this morning you need someone to pray with you to encourage you as Jesus deals with you. As Beno leads in worship and communion, maybe today might be a day where you might have to do something unusual and you might just need to come up and say, Sam, pray with me. I need God's healing in my life. If you need that, I'm going to be sitting right up here. I will pray with you. But this morning, don't go back to bondage. Don't go back to being abandoned and abused. In Jesus, you have family. In Jesus, you have a faithful God who never leaves you. In Jesus, you have freedom not to be bound to doing things and trying to earn something from God. You have been accepted. You are loved. We're about to enter into the table. If there's one evidence of how much God loves you, it is that table. It is that table. You don't come to the table because you deserve it. You come to the table because when you didn't deserve it, Jesus died for you. And so as we come to the table this morning, I'm going to ask you, would you allow the Holy Spirit to examine your hearts, every part of it? Would you allow him to see what is in you? And would you repent and would you ask for help? Because he is really, really good at helping. That's what he loves to do. Call on me and I will answer. He's a faithful God. He never abandons you. So as you come to the table and grab the elements, would you be reminded of the faithful God who loves you, who cares for you? Would you pray with me? Father, I know this is a little bit longer than normal, but there's some things in here that we need to hear and wrestle with. There are things that I need to wrestle with because we try to find our satisfaction and our joy in everything but you. Some of us, it's our possessions. Some of us, it's our family. Some of us, it's even the church that we try to find our joy in. All of those things disappoint. But you bring freedom. You never abandon. And you aren't a stranger, your family. You love us. We don't have to prove ourselves to you. So God, would you work in our hearts this morning? Would you transform us for your glory? We love you. It's in Jesus' name.